Hi church, uh, I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be in my basement on a Sunday morning recording myself preaching during the midst of a pandemic, uh, but here we are. And as we're here, I can't even begin to describe how difficult it was for us as elders to cancel our, our worship gathering this morning, that in the midst of all the craziness that we're going through right now um, in our country, um, I, there's nothing that we wanted more as elders than to gather together as, as a church and to pray together and to sing together and to hear God's word together and just to be the body and just to be together in the midst of these uncertain and, and difficult days that we're walking through. But as Jared mentioned in his email last night, we thought it was best for us as a church to err on the side of caution and to simply get, try and gain some more information and to try and gauge just how severe uh, things really are when it comes to this virus and then to evaluate our plan after that. So then please know we didn't make this decision out of fear. Instead, we made this decision out of love and out of a heart of compassion for those within our church body, particularly those who are, who are more at risk and more vulnerable, but also a heart of love for those within our community and those within our city. And, and again, in particular, those who are in that more at-risk category. So then when, since we couldn't meet together this morning, we as elders still wanted to shepherd you. And so we thought this video would be the next best thing. And so what I'm going to do during our time together is I'm just going to do what I do on most Sunday mornings. I'm, I'm going to preach. That this is going to seem a little weird. It's, it's weird to me. It's probably going to seem a little weird to you, preaching sermon recorded in a basement. At the same time, this is our attempt, again, as elders, to, to love you well, to care for you well, and to shepherd you well, and to let you know that you are not alone and that we're all in this together in the midst of these uncertain um, times that we're walking through within our lives and within our country. And so, if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Psalm chapter 46. That Psalm 46 is the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. And the reason that I chose this particular passage of Scripture is because this psalm is about all about not fearing. And not fearing in times of trouble and not fearing in times of uncertainty and threat. Now I know all of you aren't, aren't struggling necessarily with that particular emotion, that emotion of fear. But I do know that some within our body are. And I, and I know that in the days to come, some of you who are not struggling with it now, some of you might be struggling with it in the future. And not only that, but all of us have someone in our lives, whether that be a neighbor or a co-worker or a family member, who is struggling with fear and anxiety and worry in light of the situation in which we find ourselves in today. And so then my hope and my prayer is that no matter where you find yourself when it comes to this emotion of fear, I, I pray that God would use this particular passage of Scripture for us this morning to help to comfort us and to help shepherd and guide and lead us as we walk through this time of uncertainty in our lives. And so then here, here's the context of Psalm chapter 46. The city of Jerusalem is under attack. That armies have surrounded the city and threatened the very existence of the city and are seeking to attack and to utterly destroy and annihilate the city and those within the city. And so then it's in the midst of that threat of destruction and the threat of attack that the psalmist writes this psalm to remind the people of Israel in Jerusalem that they have absolutely nothing to fear. And so then let's read this psalm together and then we'll dive into it during the rest of our time together. Psalm 46, the psalmist writes, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, 
There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So come and behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wa- he makes wars, excuse me, cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let me pray for us. Lord, I pray that in the midst of this strange week in which we've heard all types of different messages from all different types of people, from the media, from politicians, from medical experts, from news outlets, to social media, to friends and family members and co-workers and everybody else. I pray that this morning, the one word that we want to hear more than anything else and that we need to hear more than anything else is yours. And so then as we gather together around your word this morning, I pray that you would use it to do what only your word can do. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So then as we begin to jump into Psalm 46 this morning, I want to begin specifically in verse 2 together. And the reason I want to begin in verse 2 is because verse 2 is going to set up the rest of our psalm and, and really set the context for this psalm and our time together. So then look at verse Two with me. The psalmist writes this. He says, Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. So then what the psalmist is describing here, he's describing the worst case scenario. He's saying, even if things get this bad, even if it gets so bad where the earth starts giving giving way and and tumbling down and, and collapsing, even if it gets so bad that the mountains start crumbling, even if it gets so bad that the waters start roaring and flooding and covering the earth, even if it gets that bad, even then, the psalmist says, we will not fear. We will not be afraid. Which then begs the question, why? Why? Even if things get that bad, why isn't the psalmist going to be afraid? What's going to keep him and the rest of those in Jerusalem from panicking and freaking out, even if the worst case scenario they can think of happens? Well, here's why. The rest of the psalm is going to show us. The rest of the psalm is going to explain why the psalmist and those in Jerusalem aren't going to fear, even if all the world around them starts collapsing, and starts tumbling down. And this is a word we need to hear for us this morning as well. Because in the midst of a world that is panicking, in the midst of the world that is freaking out, in the midst of a world that seems to be tumbling down, then we need to know the same reasons for why we shouldn't fear, and why we shouldn't panic, and for why we shouldn't worry. In, in the midst of the threat and the situations and the difficulties and troubles that we walk through and find ourselves in today. And so then what the psalmist is going to provide, he's going to, he's going to give three reasons for why he and those in Jerusalem aren't going to be afraid, even though they're, they're being threatened and even though the whole world around them seems to be tumbling. And these are the same three reasons that we shouldn't be afraid in the midst of this coronavirus outbreak and the unsettling times in which we find ourselves in as well. So what are those reasons? The first reason is this. We shouldn't fear and be afraid because God's dwelling place cannot be destroyed. 
Let me say that again. We shouldn't fear or be afraid because God's dwelling place cannot be destroyed. So then in verse 2 that we just read, the psalmist paints this scene and describes this picture of upheaval and disaster and the world crumbling and tumbling down. Look then at at what he writes in verse 4, though. In verse 4, he says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. So then do you see the contrast that the psalmist is making here between the scene that he paints in verses 2 and 3 with the scene that he paints here in verse 4? In verse 2 and 3, again, upheaval, disaster, in all of creation, literally collapsing and tumbling down. But in the midst of that disaster, in the midst of that, what we have is one city who is at complete peace, who is at complete rest. In the midst of all the panic and fear and crumbling and tumbling that is going all around her, There's one city who is sound at sleep at night, at total, complete peace and rest. And that one city is none other than the city of God, which is a reference to the city of Jerusalem. That while the rest of creation is collapsing and toppling over, Jerusalem, I love how the psalmist describes this, Jerusalem as a nice flowing river whose streams make glad the city of God. Which then begs this question. How? How in the world can this city be at such rest and peace and even glad when everything or else around them is falling apart and tumbling down and, and being destroyed? Well, do you know what the answer is? The answer is because God's in that city. The answer is, is God dwells in that city. Whereas verse 4 says, look there again, that city is the holy habitation of the Most High. And we, we know this, right? In the Old Testament, God dwelled where? God dwelled in the temple that Solomon built in Jerusalem. And so then just follow the, the logic of the psalmist here. Then since God is in the midst of Jerusalem, and since Jerusalem is the dwelling place of God, then look what the psalmist says there in verse 5. He says, God is in the midst of her, so then she shall not be moved. In other words, since God is in the midst of Jerusalem, and, and since God is dwelling in Jerusalem, since Jerusalem is the dwelling place of God, in Jerusalem and those in Jerusalem aren't going to be defeated. They, they can't be destroyed. They can't be touched. They can't be moved. They can't be shaken. They can't, they can't be wiped out. And the reason for that is, isn't because they have a bigger, better, better army than the armies of those who are threatening them. Or it's not because they have better fighting skills and more advanced fighting skills than the armies that are attacking them and fighting against them. Instead, the one and only reason Jerusalem is to is able to sustain and survive a military invasion without being harmed and with a heart attitude of complete peace and surety and confidence that they will not be touched and that they will not be moved and that they will not be shaken. The reason that those in Jerusalem can respond this way is because Jerusalem is the dwelling place of God and the dwelling place of God can't be harmed. It can't be touched. It can't be destroyed. And so then think about how this applies to us now as a church. In other words, in in the Old Testament, the dwelling place of God, as I mentioned, was in the temple in Jerusalem. Fast forward hundreds of years, where's the dwelling place of God now? The dwelling place of God is in us, the church. 
we're now the dwelling place of God, that God dwells now by his spirit. But, but that's not all. It, it gets even better. Not only are we the dwelling place of God now, but we're going to be his dwelling place in the future forever. Oh, you have to see this. And I want you to see, turn to Revelation chapter 21. And I want you to see how Revelation chapter 21 ties to and is closely connected with everything that we're seeing here in Psalm chapter 46. Turn to Revelation chapter 21 with me real quick. Last book in the Bible. John is writing here and he's describing what's going to happen when Jesus returns once and for all to this earth. And look what he says starting there in verse 1. And keep Psalm chapter 46 in the back of your mind as we're reading this. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, there it is, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, here it comes, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Oh, that picture right there is a picture of what awaits every single follower of Jesus. That when Jesus returns, Jerusalem isn't going to be isolated to the, just this to being just this one little city in the Middle East. Instead, when Jesus returns, the whole earth is going to be is going to be is going to be Jerusalem. In other words, the whole earth is going to be the city of God. The whole earth is going to be the dwelling place of God. And when that happens, then just like the invading armies couldn't touch God's people that were in Jerusalem in Psalm chapter 46, so no disease or sickness or anything else will be able to touch us and harm us and or destroy us when we're dwelling in the new Jerusalem to come. And since that's true then, then we have absolutely nothing to fear in the here and now. Oh, don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. There's no guarantee that, that we won't get the virus. There's no guarantee that our lives won't be turned upside down in a hundred different ways in the weeks or the days or the, even the months to come. But if you're a follower of Christ, there is one thing that is guaranteed. And that guarantee is this. It's that one day we're going to be in the new Jerusalem, the dwelling place of God, where nothing will be able to threaten us and touch us ever, ever again. And because of that, we have absolutely nothing to fear in the here and now. Which then leads to the second reason we shouldn't fear. And the second reason is this. We shouldn't fear because God will one day fight and wipe out all of our enemies. Let me say that again. We shouldn't fear because God will one day fight and wipe out all of our enemies. This is the transition that the psalmist makes at the very end of verse 5. Look there with me. Since God is in the midst of Jerusalem, look what God's going to do. It says that God will help her, talking about Jerusalem, when morning dawns. And look at how he's going to help her in verse 6. The nations rage, the, the kingdoms totter. So he's describing the, the armies and the nations that are surrounding Jerusalem and, and the, the threat that they're posing as they're seeking to attack and destroy Jerusalem and those in Jerusalem. But as the nations are raging, the kingdom's tottering. Look at what God does to them. He utters his voice and the earth melts. Meaning God just speaks. He just utters a word. He just speaks his voice. And Israel's enemies on the earth just melt. They're just wiped out. They're just destroyed. Just with a just with a word. And here's how God is able to do this. And why God is able to do this. Look at verse 7. It's because the Lord of hosts is with us. That, that title there, that name there, the Lord of hosts, could literally be translated as the Lord of armies. And just think about that. That's who God is. He is our mighty warrior. And as our mighty warrior, the Lord of armies, the commander of armies, he fights on behalf of his people and he defeats the enemies of his people. That's why then, if you go down to verse 8, the psalmist then invites others to come and behold the works of the Lord, 
and how he has brought desolations on the earth. In other words, he's inviting others to come and see how this mighty word, the the Lord of armies, has destroyed and defeated and wiped out Israel's enemies who are attacking them. And in verse 9, then he, he goes on to describe how he defeats and destroyed Israel's enemies. Look at verse 9. He says, he makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Oh, that's a description there of the Lord of armies at work. It's the description there of the Lord of armies fighting on behalf of his people, defeating and destroying the enemies of his people. But then look at verse 10. God begins to speak and he begins to talk. And do you know who he begins to speak to and talk to here in verse 10? He begins to speak to and talk to the enemies of his people who are threatening his people and seeking to attack and destroy his people. And God begins to talk a little smack to them. And look what he says and tells them in verse 10. He says, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. Those two words there at the very beginning of verse 10, be still here, literally means drop your hands. In other words, what what he's saying here is give up. Drop your weapons. Drop drop your hands. Put put your hands down. Stop fighting. It's It's what God is telling the enemies of his people. And the reason he's telling them this, the reason he's telling them to just drop their hands and and give up is because they're fighting a losing battle. And the reason they're fighting a losing battle is because they're fighting against God. There's no way that Israel's enemies are going to be able to defeat God. And the reason that there's no way that Israel's enemies are going to be able to defeat God is because God is going to be exalted among the nations. He's going to be exalted in all the earth. And since he's going to be exalted among all the nations and in all the earth, then there's no way, there's no way then that Israel's enemies are going to be able to defeat him. Because of that, then they might as well drop their hands and give up and quit fighting. Because they're about to be destroyed. Then in verse 11, we see the same refrain repeated once again that we saw in verse 11. Look there with me in verse 11. He says, the, once again, he says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of armies is with us. That right there is why Jerusalem shouldn't be afraid, even though the world seems to be tumbling down and even though the threat of their very existence is real all around them. They can sleep well at night when all these armies have surrounded their city and are seeking to destroy them. And the reason they can do that is because the Lord of armies is with them. And since he's with them, he's going to fight for them. And he's going to defeat all of their enemies, and whip all of their little heinies. And no one and no thing is ever going to be able to defeat him or touch his people. Why? Because the Lord of armies is with them, and the Lord of armies is on their side. And because of that, then, they have absolutely nothing to fear. And the same is true for us today. Uh, don't don't get me wrong. There, there's a big, bad virus out there that, that no one has been able to defeat. And it just keeps on spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading. And that's making a lot of people pretty anxious. But this same Lord of Armies who conquered and defeated Israel's enemies in Jerusalem is one day going to completely wipe out and going to completely and totally conquer and defeat this virus and completely wipe it off the face of the planet. And the reason that we know that is because of what John writes once again in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. John says that in this new Jerusalem to come, this dwelling place of God that we're going to live forever, this new 
Jerusalem to come. God's, uh, John, John says in Revelation 21, 4, that in that new Jerusalem to come, that God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes and that death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, nor the coronavirus anymore. For the former things have passed away. Oh, this right here is our confidence and our hope and our security in the midst of these troubling days. We know that the Lord of armies is with us and that the Lord of armies is on our side. And we know because of that, that one day he is going to wipe out and defeat all of our enemies. And because of that, then we have absolutely nothing to fear in the here and now. That that virus and all the trouble that that virus is bringing. It might last the rest of our lives here on earth, but it's not going to last forever. Instead, one day, and we don't know when, but one day, God, just like he did to Israel's enemies, God is going to utter a word, and that coronavirus is going to and be destroyed and be completely wiped away once and for all, forever. And therefore, we have absolutely nothing to fear. Which then leads to the third and final reason we shouldn't fear, which is this. We shouldn't fear because God is our fortress and refuge. Oh, I skipped over these verses earlier, but or this particular portion of these verses earlier, but, but look at the very end of verse 7, and then also again at the very end of verse 11. See the same refrain repeated at the end of both verses. That the psalmist reminds us, and the end of both of those verses, that the God of Jacob is our fortress. So this word fortress here is specifically and, and literally means a high place. And it's a reference to a high place that people run to and go to, for safety and protection and security in times of danger and times of, of harm. And the reason they go there is, is to be kept safe. And so imagine, this is a bad illustration, but you're being chased by a bear. What do you do? You climb a tree. Why? Because it's high and the bear can't get there. It's the same picture, the same illustration that, that the psalmist is painting here when it comes to who God is. That God is our fortress. He's our high place. He's our place we run to and go to in times of trouble, in times of danger, where we find safety and protection and security when we're threatened. He uses the same picture and, and metaphor as well in, in verse 1. Look at look with me there at the very beginning of verse 1. He doesn't use the word fortress in verse 1. Instead, he says that God is our refuge, which we know what a refuge is, right? A refuge is kind of like a fortress. It's a place of safety. It's a place of protection from threat and harm and, and danger. Then he goes on in verse 1, he says that God is our strength. God is our strength, that even in the midst of this threat and potential harm and danger, that God is the one who's strengthening us. He is our strength. That's not all. He also says that God is our very present help in trouble. Meaning within the context here that, that God helps us by guarding us, by protecting us from trouble. Just like we've seen all throughout the psalm, particularly there in verse 5. So then we, when we put all these descriptions of, of God together, that he's our fortress, he's our refuge, he's our strength, he's our, he's our help. When we put all these descriptions of God together, then the overall picture of God that we see is one of safety. It's one of security. It's one of protection. And this right here, is where God has been exposing our hearts this week, isn't it? That in the midst of all the craziness of this past week, God's been exposing all of the other little fortresses and places of refuge that before now, that we've been running to, to find safety in, to find security in, to find protection in from the troubles of life. And the way that he's been exposing them in our lives is by removing them from our lives. And when he's removed them, then that's where that sense of panic and that sense of fear and that sense of anxiety that we felt this week, 
has been coming from. It's been coming from having our, all of our little fortresses and the places we run to for safety and security and protection being removed from us one by one by one by one. But, but here's the truth that I want to remind you of this morning. This is the truth that this passage ultimately reminds us of here. And that truth is this. It's that if you are in Christ, meaning if you're a Christian, if you have turned from yourself and your sin and trusted in Jesus in a substitutionary death on the cross alone for your salvation to rescue you from the judgment of God and the wrath of God that you deserve for your sin and to make you righteous before him. If that is your only hope that you are looking for, then as a Christian, I want to remind you that you are just as safe and secure and protected today in the midst of the outbreak of the coronavirus as you were the very second that God caused your dead heart to come alive and trust and believe in Jesus. Oh, we, we live in a day that we might not be 100% safe and secure from the coronavirus, but if we're in Christ, if, then we're, we're safe and we're secure from an even greater enemy from an even greater threat than the coronavirus. Instead, if we're in Christ, we're, we're saved and protected and safe and secure from the greatest enemy of all. Eternal death. Eternal judgment. The wrath of God. That because of the blood of Jesus in our place, the wrath of God, our greatest enemy, won't ever touch us. The death we deserve, the eternal death we deserve, won't ever harm us. Instead, if we're in Christ, then we're fully, 100% safe and secure and protected from the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to us. And from the greatest threat and from the greatest danger that could overcome us, we're safe. We're secure. We're protected. And because that's true then, then there's no reason that we should fear this lesser enemy that's going around. There's no reason that we should be anxious and worried about this lesser enemy that's going around. Oh, it might ultimately defeat us in this life. But if we're in Christ, then we can be rest assured that we're fully protected and safe from the greatest enemy of all. And because of that, then we have absolutely nothing to fear in the here and now. Because we know that in the end, no matter how things turn out here on earth, we're fully protected and we're completely safe from the greatest enemy of all. And so in the midst of all the pandemonium, in the midst of all the fear and panic and uncertainty of the days in which we're walking through. We can do that as Christians and as a church, as people who, who are, have complete confidence and surety and hope of protection and safety and security because we are in the dwelling place of God. And the Lord of armies is fighting for us and with us. And therefore, there is nothing that can ultimately harm us or touch us in Christ. And saying that, though, I want to leave us with a couple reminders, and then we'll be done. And those reminders are these. First of all, not fearing doesn't mean being reckless or being irresponsible or being unwise. Instead, like follow those CDC guidelines and health guidelines that have been going around. Don't do anything that would put other people at jeopardy or harm, especially those who are more vulnerable and, and at risk. 
in different ways. Instead, be wise. Don't just think about yourself, but think about, hey, I, I'm a, I could be a carrier of this virus and put somebody in harm's way. So just be sensitive, be compassionate, and be cautious, and be wise. Secondly, as a church, there, there are different perspectives when it comes to our church, when it comes to this virus and all that's going around, and even us canceling this morning. And I, I get that, and I understand that, and have no problems with that whatsoever. But I would say that in the midst of all the different perspectives we have, some think we're overacting, others are, are, are more struggling with fear. But in the midst of that, let's all be sensitive to one another. Let's give each other grace. Let's not be judgmental of one another and the decisions people are making in the midst of this. Let's not be fearful. Let's all, let's all be sensitive and compassionate and gracious to one another. Thirdly, as church members, let's check up on one another. Even though that we're not gathering together, that doesn't. we're still the body. We still need to care for one another and look out for one another. So check up on one another. Email, text, call. See how people are doing. Think about who the news of this week and the news to come in the days ahead could impact the most within our body. And call them, text them, check up on them. Maybe it's somebody who needs, who's really just afraid to go out of their house and for good reason because they're, they're more susceptible to this virus and they don't need to be getting out. That would cause them great harm and put them in great jeopardy. So maybe they need somebody to go get groceries for them. Maybe they need somebody to run some errands for them. Maybe they need something. I don't know what it is. But think about who within our church that you can serve and help and reach out to. Think about that when it comes to your neighbors and community and the city in which we live and friends that you have and coworkers you have. How can you serve and care for them? Who can you help in the midst of these troubling days? And most of all, the best way we can serve those who are neighbors and those within our community is to share the hope of Christ with them to share why we don't fear, to share the reasons why we don't fear, and to share the gospel gospel with them. In the days to come, we don't, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen 30 minutes from now, five minutes from now. But in the midst of that, we're, we're praying as elders. We're consulting one another and outside um, help as elders, trying to make the best decisions for us. And so we'll, we'll send out more information when it comes to this Wednesday night and whether or not we're going to meet and have our D.C. equipping meeting all together. We'll send out more information later on in the week when it comes to whether or not we're going to gather together next Sunday all together and what that's going to look like. We're not for sure. We're praying. We're seeking the Lord's wisdom. And we would appreciate if you would pray for us as well. Please know, church, we love you. We're praying for you. And I pray that the hope and truth of God's word would sound loudest in your lives this week. It's in Jesus' name that we ask all this. Amen. Love you, church.